I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Maureen Dubrell, who will be presenting Overview and Medical Management of Spondyloarthritis. Dr. Dubrell is a rheumatologist and assistant professor of medicine. She works at the Boston University School of Medicine and the VA Boston Healthcare System. Her research focuses on medications for spondyloarthritis, including their benefits and possible side effects. Dr. Dubril serves as education chair and board member for Spartan, the spondyloarthritis research and treatment network, as a medical advisor for SAA, serving on our medical board, and received the SAA Burkell Award in 2018. Welcome, Dr. Dubril. We're so excited to have you with us today. Aline, thank you so much for inviting me. I am uh, very honored and excited to be part of this forum, and I just wanted to thank all the attendees for taking time out of your busy lives to be part of this forum and the activities and discussion. Um, so I will share my screen. Is this looking okay? Looks fantastic. Okay, great. Well, I will start uh, just on the business side with my disclosures uh, related to uh, my work serving as an advisor for some pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, I also served on a committee for the American College of Rheumatology um, to develop guidelines for spondyl arthritis treatment. But what I'll talk about in this talk really reflects my opinions and my interpretation of science that has been done and doesn't necessarily reflect um, anyone else's. So an outline of what I will plan to cover is a brief overview of axial spondyl arthritis as a spectrum of disease. I'll introduce you to the 2019 treatment guidelines if you haven't already been introduced. And then I'll review four specific classes of medications that are used currently, or I think will be used in the very near future for treatment of axial spondyl arthritis. And those are listed here. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, abbreviated NSAIDs, TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, Janus kinase or JAK inhibitors, and then a couple of um, other bonus concepts. Uh, one is a treat to target approach to uh, axial spondyl arthritis. And then uh, lastly, AXPA treatments and uh, COVID infection. So starting off with the spectrum of axial spa, um, what we now know and what we've understood over the last about uh, 20 years or so is that axial spondyl arthritis, which I'll abbreviate AXPA, uh, begins as inflammation in the bones, typically in the bones of the pelvis around the sacroiliac joints. We're able to see this on MRI, which shows early inflammatory changes um, based on the presence of excess water in the tissues. And what I've shown in this image on the left side is an MRI around the sacroiliac joints with the white arrow pointing to um, white color within the bone showing the presence of inflammation. Now this can be an indication of early inflammation among people that will go on to develop ankylosing spondylitis, or this can be present among people that have a little bit milder form of disease, non-radiographic axial spa, who never go on to develop uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, on the other side of the screen here, we see um, the classic changes in an x-ray of the pelvis um, demonstrating ankylosing spondylitis, or another recent term for it is radiographic axial spa, meaning that there are x-ray changes. And we'll see a variety of different changes around the joints that include different scarring of the bone or fusion of the bones in the SI joints. And this reflects longstanding inflammation um, with damage to that uh, SI joint. Now, as I mentioned, not everyone who has non-radiographic axial spa will go on to develop ankylosing spondylitis. The estimates are between a quarter and a half of people will go on to develop ankylosing spondylitis after about 10 years. I also wanted to draw your attention to the way uh, scientists and researchers think about axial spondyl arthritis, meaning affecting the joints of the spine and the chest wall uh, relative to peripheral arthritis, which involves the joints of the arms and legs outside of the spine. 
So there are several conditions you probably have heard of that tend to be more peripheral involving the arms and legs. Those are things like psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, which happens after infections, and inflammatory bowel disease or IBD associated arthritis, which tend to affect peripheral joints more so than the spine, but you can see there's some overlap where this right blue circle represents spine involvement. In that right blue circle, we tend to think of these conditions called axial spondylarthritis, and that's the non-radiographic form I just showed, as well as ankylosing spondylitis. You can see, although they're in that right blue circle, there's also still some overlap and people may have involvement or arthritis of joints in the arms and legs as well. So we'll dive right into treatment guidelines. I'm about to show you perhaps the busiest figure um, in this talk today, and it's pulled directly from the guidelines, the references listed here. Um, because of time limitations, we won't go through this in great detail, but I did want to point out a few um, foundational concepts from this um, report. So the report divides the treatment into active axial spa or stable. What I'm showing here is the active recommendations and the three panels. The top panel shows first line medication therapy. The middle shows second, meaning if a person didn't feel any better, had side effects to the first therapy, they move on to the second and then third line therapy. So the point I wanna highlight is in the top panel, looking at first line therapy, we see a couple things that are shaded green, meaning there are recommendations in favor of doing these things or for doing these things. And you'll see NSAIDs highlighted bright green, meaning a strong recommendation, and physical therapy, bright green. So these are the foundational treatments of axial spondyl arthritis, regardless of non-radiographic or ankylosing spondylitis. Um, these, these form the foundation of treatment, and we'll go on to discuss the medications more. I also wanted to uh, draw your attention, if you don't already have this uh, in your pocket, the SAA put out a pocket card um, summarizing these guidelines in 2019. Um, and it's really helpful. There's several other pages of it that include um, a little bit more description, but this table one is also really helpful to summarize the medications, uh, many of which we'll speak about today. So the first class of medications I'll discuss is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And what I'll be discussing is all the pill forms of these medications. Uh, what I have to say does really not apply to the, um, the skin creams or gels uh, that contain NSAIDs because they may not have the same effects as pills. So there's really great news about NSAIDs. Um, these are some of our oldest medications and those for which we have quite a bit of uh, data about their uh, efficacy and safety. And the greatest news is that for about 70% of people with axial spa, NSAIDs reduce pain and stiffness. You could compare this to people who have back pain from other causes other than axial spa and only about 15% of those people feel better. So these tend to work pretty well. And we can also look at um, one way of thinking about spondylarthritis activity, which is partial remission, so nearly complete resolution of symptoms. And that happens for about half of people who use NSAIDs. Besides symptom improvement, we also know that NSAIDs improve things we can measure um, in blood tests and imaging. And so that's through looking at the bone inflammation on MRI that improves with NSAIDs as does this blood test called CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. So these are pretty great medications, um, especially to start with for AXPA, but of course not perfect for everyone. I'm gonna show you one more pretty complicated figure, um, and that is because I often get asked this question um, about how do we pick an NSAID medication? What I'm showing on the right here is a really nice um, review and summary of many other studies that was done by Dr. Rung Cheng Wang. And it shows uh, two dozen NSAID medications that are listed in the left part of this figure. I've put yellow arrows to those that are most common in the United States. So several of these are not even available in the United States. But what Dr. Wang did is to look across um, all of these NSAID trials and to uh, compare the benefit of NSAID relative to the benefit of placebo 
uh, among people with AXPA who got randomized to these arms. What you can see when we look at the four yellow arrow medications, naproxen, indomethacin, meloxicam, and celecoxib, all available in the United States, is that there's not much difference. Relative to placebo, these tend to improve or reduce symptoms by a difference of about one. And so when people ask about NSAIDs, there are often other things besides this type of data that helps us uh, to pick one. So they all reduce pain by about the same amount. The treatment guidelines by the experts had no preference for which NSAID to use. And so um, as a as a, you know, one person with a, one experience and one medical history, your medical history um, can actually help guide which uh, medication to choose. In particular, if you've had uh, stomach ulcers, if you've had a heart attack or stroke, then that will help you and your healthcare provider to pick the safest NSAID. Um, how you perceive risk of side effects is also an important reason to consider one over the other. If you've had some experience taking one of the NSAIDs and know that it uh, helps you to feel much better, then that's a great reason to remain on that one instead of trying something else. Um, some of these medications are also prescription medications. And so we do take into account if an insurance, health insurance company will cover the medications or if there's a great out-of-pocket cost. And then uh, one really interesting uh, aspect about choosing an NSAID for axial spa is that we may be able to use your own genetics, your own genetics about metabolism of medications to help pick a medication that's least likely to have side effects for you and possibly most likely to work. So that's something we're just getting started with in the VA on a national level and something you may see um, in other healthcare systems in the coming years. One other amazing aspect about NSAIDs is that they may also prevent some of the bony damage that happens with axial spa. So in that first picture I showed you, we start with inflammation that's present on MRI and some people go on to have permanent bony damage. Um, the research for NSAIDs is conflicting, but I think still promising. There was a two year randomized trial among people with ankylosing spondylitis that randomized people to either use NSAIDs continuously or use them on and off as they needed for symptoms. And what they saw is that there was less bone damage among people who used NSAIDs continuously. Um, there was also a study in 2012 of people with ankylosing spondylitis and non-radiographic AXPA. And this showed that people who used uh, NSAIDs more often and used a higher dose tended to have less bony damage. The data against um, use of NSAIDs in preventing bone damage came from a two-year trial in ankylosing spondylitis that showed no difference between those who used continuously and those who used as needed. So we do still need more information about how NSAIDs um, affect bone formation, um, but this is one thing I keep in mind um, when I'm asking people to try these medications. So we'll move on to the next class of medications, and these are recommended uh, if a person doesn't have enough improvement in their axial spondyl arthritis symptoms on NSAIDs and physical therapy alone. The next class is called tumor necrosis alpha inhibitors, and we generally shorten that to be TNF inhibitors. I'm showing in the right part of this figure a uh, white blood cell, so an immune system cell that is, fights infection, but also causes inflammation. What we see in the middle of the figure is this blue uh, double line, which is the cell membrane. So the blue part at the bottom of the field is inside the cell. The yellow stuff on top of the um, figure is outside the cell. And outside the cell within the fluid, there are chemical signals. And TNF or tumor necrosis factor is one of those cell signals that prompts the cell to um, start developing inflammation. TNF can be floating around within the fluid there. It can also be part of the cell membrane. And the way these TNF inhibitors work is um, the upside down Y shapes that are green and blue in this figure are TNF inhibitors. They are the same shape as antibodies and they kind of fool the TNF uh, molecules or attached to the TNF molecules 
um, and block the TNF from interacting with the cell and causing downstream inflammation. So TNF inhibitors can be given by injection or infusion. There are no pill forms of TNF inhibitors. Um, and that is because they are very big protein molecules that if you had to ate them by a pill, they would get digested in your stomach like other proteins. Um, so injections for TNF inhibitors are given every one to four weeks. And there are four TNF inhibitors that are available. Um, they're listed here. So adalimumab is the most common one. The brand name of that is Humira. And they're also biosimilars of this medication. I'll talk about biosimilars in a moment. The next injection is sertilizumab, brand name Simzia. The third one, etanercept, brand name Embrel. And the fourth is golimumab, or brand name Symphony. Now, regarding biosimilars, these are like the generic versions of biologic medications. So they're proteins that look very similar to the original uh, medication, and they act in the same way, but they're not the original um, medication. There are two TNF inhibitors that can be given by infusion, and these are given every four to six weeks. Infliximab with the brand name Remicade is one of them, and the other is Bolimumab or Symphony, so that can be given either by injection or infusion. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about starting one of these medications, people really want to understand the mechanics because giving yourself a shot is not something everyone is immediately eager to do. So uh, the makers of these meds have made it pretty easy. Um, there are these auto-injector medications shown in the left part, so the four injection TNF inhibitors. For these auto-injectors, there's a needle within the device that with a single click of um, the button, the needle is extended into the skin and after five or 10 seconds, it's retracted back up into the device. So it means that the person doesn't need to touch a needle and they're not um, quite as close to how the needle um, gets into their skin. The pre-filled syringes are shown on the right. And for these uh, version of the injection, the person giving the shot would take the cap off the end of the needle the needle is then exposed. They would put it under the skin of the person receiving the injection, and then they can depress the plunger at whatever speed they choose. So for some people, they prefer these pre-filled syringes because they can control and they can actually do the injection pretty slowly over half a minute or a minute, and they find that that's more comfortable. Um, I will not show you uh, the infusion of medications, but that typically is done in a hospital or an infusion suite. Um, what I did want to review with you is how the uh, researchers and scientists so far have determined or made the call as to whether medication works for AXPA. And that's using this trial outcome called ASAS40. Um, it was developed by a leading research group out of Europe. And there are four things that go into making this calculation. So one is the, the person with AXPA and their overall or global assessment of how active their AXPA is. So we ask them to rate this on a zero to 10 scale where zero is inactive and 10 is the worst activity they could imagine. The second item here is back pain severity, again, on a zero to 10 scale. The third is physical function, meaning how well you can do common activities that a person needs to do in their daily life. And this is assessed using a questionnaire called BASV, again, on a zero to 10 scale. The fourth thing that goes into this ASAS 40 outcome is a, an average of two questions about inflammation. And so they ask about a person's discomfort in their back or stiffness in their back, again, on a zero to 10 scale. Um, as the name of this outcome implies, SS40, we look for a 40% improvement in these four things to say that a person did well enough or they responded or got better with the medication. So three out of these four things need to improve by 40%, and the fourth domain or fourth topic can't get worse by more than 20%. So this is the way experts uh, over time have um, decided how to judge whether a new medication works relative to an, an older medication or relative to placebo. You can see based on the four things here, this may not address everything you're experiencing related to spondyloarthritis. So fatigue isn't specifically addressed. 
things outside of the spine aren't specifically addressed, like psoriasis, uveitis, bowel inflammation. So this is probably not perfect for everyone, but this is the way scientists decided to get at the spine and back symptoms as what we think is the most important part of axial spondylarthritis. So there's great news in that TNF inhibitors work using this OSS40 outcome, they work for about half of people with axial spa. And the best effect, the best benefit from TNF inhibitors is after a person has been using them for at least three months, up to about six months. When we compare people with ankylosing spondylitis versus those with non-radiographic axial spa, it's about the same percent of people that do better with TNF inhibitors. 40 to 50 percent of those with ankylosing spondylitis versus 35 to 60 of those with non-radiographic axial spa. We can compare that to the percentage of people who got placebo and got better, and that's only around 15 or 20 percent. So you can see that the treatment makes people more likely to feel better uh, than placebo. Um, I also wanted to talk about the bone formation um, and excess bone formation and whether TNF inhibitors may help. So I had shown this, um, talked about this a little bit with relation to NSAIDs, and I wanted to give a little more detail here with TNF inhibitors. So the reason we're concerned is not necessarily in, related to excess bone formation in the pelvis. Um, it's not a joint that has a lot of um, causes a lot of functional problems, but elsewhere in the spine, excess bone formation can cause big problems and reduce movement. So what's shown here is a couple of stacked uh, spinal bones on top of each other with a disc in the middle. On the left side, you can see at the corners, there are a bunch of little pink and red cells, inflammation cells, that happen as part of the spondylarthritis process. In the middle of figure, we see um, a whitish or yellowish substance, and that's the body's attempt to repair things with fat deposition. But what we see also on the right side is that the, there is an abnormal repair process in people who have axial spot and that they tend to form excess bone formation, tend to form excess bone at places where there has been inflammation. And so on the right side, um, we see those two vertebral bones kind of growing toward each other, each other. And after this has been going on for a period of time, a couple of years, those two bones can actually grow together. And so you can imagine if spine bones are connected, that really prevents people from being very flexible and moving well. So we spoke about TNF inhibitors having a benefit to the pain and symptoms of spondyl arthritis in about half of people. But what's also really promising is that TNF inhibitors may prevent excess bone formation um, if they're started early and used for a couple of years or longer. This information is from a study by Dr. Nigel Haroon out of University of Toronto. And it is observational data, meaning people weren't randomized to get early or late treatment, but he looked at the uh, health records of people who had axial spa and started treatment early or late. What's in this figure, along the bottom, we see months going from zero to 100 months. And then in the um, left part of the figure, we see excess bone formation, where at the bottom of the figure is less or no bone formation, and at the top of the figure is more bone formation. So the top is, is worse. Within the figure, we see um, the darker triangles. Dark black triangles are those who got started with treatment later after two years of symptoms. And in the white squares, which are quite tiny, there are those that got started on early treatment. What we see in the later treatment is that people tended to have more bone formation earlier. So after even three years of symptoms, they tended to have bone formation, whereas those with early treatment tended to only have bone formation after six or seven years. More research is really needed to understand this effect and how, how much we may prevent bone formation by using treatments early. So we've talked about the good effects of TNF inhibitors, but what are the, um, what are the less desirable or side effects? So most important is that TNF inhibitors do increase the risk of infections. And this is true for infections across the board, regard regardless of what microorganism might be causing the infection. So bacteria, viruses, fungus, and unusual types of infections. 
Now we think the risk of infection is not increased a, a huge amount by taking a TNF inhibitor. Studies have shown that a risk of a serious infection, which is one that causes a person to need to be in the hospital, the risk is around 3%, so three out of every 100 people who take a TNF inhibitor will have an infection ser serious enough to end up in the hospital uh, because of using a TNF inhibitor. When we have compared this to the risk with using pill forms of medication, again, it's not available for AXPA, but for people with rheumatoid arthritis, a similar inflammatory condition, those who take pills have a risk of around 2%. So we think the increased risk is only around 1% for using a TNF inhibitor relative to other medications. Um, however, there are some infections for which there's you know, greater concern and the risk is more important. That's for, in the bottom couple bullets, uh, the risk of tuberculosis. Even if a person didn't have active lung tuberculosis before, but even in their childhood or um, teenage years, they were exposed to a family member that had tuberculosis, they need to be tested and may need to start treatment for TB before using a TNF inhibitor. Similarly, we wanna check people for hepatitis B or C, or if you live in a region of the US where there's, there are fungal infections in the environment, um, fungus throughout the environment, we would test for those before starting a TNF inhibitor. Um, what was a concern early, uh, over 15 or 20 years ago, was that TNF inhibitors might increase risks of cancers, and this is quite concerning for many people. It's hard to study because cancers are thankfully rare events, and if we think of a one-year trial of a medication, there aren't many people in the course of a year who would develop a cancer, so it's a little bit difficult to assess by uh, statistical methods. However, we have a lot of data from rheumatoid arthritis trials and other observation um, of people who have used TNF inhibitors and have rheumatoid arthritis. From those data, there has been no increased risk of cancers. From other conditions, there has been a small increased risk of lymphoma. This is in people who have juvenile arthritis and those who have inflammatory bowel disease regardless of arthritis. We don't think these data can really um, directly tell us about what happens in XBA because people with these conditions have inflammation at other sites, um, likely more related to lymph, lymph node tissue and lymphoma risk. And we also know that the higher risk happens with more severe inflammation. So the overall takeaway is that these medications do not increase risk of cancers but we still are quite cautious with them. When um, the guidelines for AXPA came out, the decision was that we would follow the same guidelines as for rheumatoid arthritis, and that if a person has an active cancer, we don't use TNF inhibitors, but if their cancer has been in remission, then they are okay and safe to use. So with this information, uh, this is just a summary of what the FDA has approved for TNF inhibitors in terms of treating ankylosing spondylitis. So you can see Etanercept was approved almost 20 years ago uh, and the others came along uh, more recently. What uh, you may find interesting is that for non-radiographic axial spa, there's only one medication that's FDA approved um, and that's sertilizumab. And that's just because these trials are very expensive uh, to do. And the drug companies um, recognized in the treatment guidelines, uh, the experts said, these medications are good for both ankylosing spondylitis and non-radiographic. And so um, many healthcare providers will prescribe any of the TNF inhibitors for any form of axial spondylarthritis. Okay, so the next class of medications we'll discuss is IL-17 inhibitors. And these are kind of the next line therapy recommended in the guidelines if a person didn't feel better with TNF inhibitors or if they had a severe side effect. Like the TNF inhibitors, these are given by injection. Um, these, are, these are not given by an infusion. There are two medications available uh, at the present. The first is secukinumab or the brand name Cosentix. The second is ixikizumab with the brand name TALTS, and these are each given uh, every four weeks. 
There are some um, differences with the loading dose when a person first gets started, but every four weeks after that. Uh, I'm again showing you the cell membrane of a white blood cell or inflammatory cell. And there are these receptors on the cell membrane that interact again with the chemical. It's a family of chemicals, um, the IL-17 cytokine family. And they're represented by the different colored circles on the top. Medicines we have right now, secukinumab and ixikizumab, are inhibitors of only the IL-17 molecule. Uh, another one is in early stage development that's shown here. And then uh, one that is not currently available but is uh, under study and we're expecting results um, soon is called bimikizumab. And this is an inhibitor of IL-17 A and F. And I, sorry, I should say uh, these um, molecules on the surface of the white blood cell again send signals to the inside of the cell to start uh, developing inflammation processes and to recruit other inflammation cells uh, to the spine. Just like we saw for TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors work for about half of people with XPA. And the same is true about the time it takes for the best effect, which is around three to six months of use. There's very little difference, as we saw with TNF inhibitors, there's little difference as to whether a person has ankylosing spondylitis or non-radiographic axial SPA, maybe a little bit less likely to respond with non-radiographic. And the same placebo rate uh, is true with IL-17 inhibitors, around uh, 20 to 30% of people with placebo feel better as well. One benefit I really did want to draw your attention to is how well IL-17 inhibitors work um, for skin psoriasis. And for many people with skin psoriasis, these are a really great option because skin psoriasis can become 90% better, 100% better in many people who use these medications. So um, this is something that, you know, among a person and their healthcare provider, they might include their rheumatologist and their dermatologist in making the decision. So IL-17 inhibitors we saw work in about half of people uh, with axial SPA, but it's important to notice that most of the trials of IL-17 inhibitors required that a person didn't use any other biologic medication yet. So um, if they used a TNF inhibitor, they often weren't eligible to go into a trial. There has been a little bit of um, data among people who already did use a TNF inhibitor, and that makes it a little less likely that someone would improve with an IL-17 inhibitor as well. We think it's not a matter of the medication not working as well, but it may be that some people have a more severe form of disease and that uh, it takes multiple tries of a medication to find something that works. We'll next talk about side effects of IL-17 inhibitors. Uh, most importantly is the risk of infections. This is likely similar to TNF inhibitors, although we haven't had as much experience with these in terms of the number of years that these have been available. What we do know is that yeast infections are more common with use of IL-17 inhibitors. These tend to be not serious, but quite annoying uh, and can affect either the, the mouth, the esophagus, or the vaginal area. Injection site reactions are also more common with IL-17 inhibitors, but again, they tend to be more of the annoying and uncomfortable uh, type rather than a dangerous side effect. Um, what is pretty important for people to know is that IL-17 inhibitors are not a great choice for people that have inflammatory bowel diseases. So this is something like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And that is because IL-17 inhibitors may cause a flare of the bowel inflammation or may um, cause even a new diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. So we do not use them for people with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. The last class of medications I'll review is the Janus kinase inhibitors, which we uh, abbreviate JAK inhibitors. There are two of these available, um, or possibly soon available. Uh, the one with the most data is tofacitinib. The brand name is Zaljans. This is a twice daily pill for most, although a once daily is also uh, available. 
And then the other, which is not yet available, is called Upadacitinib or brand name Rinvoke. And this is a once daily medication. Showing you more cell walls, uh, excuse me, more cell membranes of white blood cells. We're now looking at um, where the, these medications work is inside the cell. So this is a pathway that involves many different cytokines or chemicals outside of the cell and how that signal gets um, transmitted inside the cell to cause inflammation. And this Janus kinase is an enzyme or protein within the cell um, that is blocked by these small molecule medications. You've heard this story before. JAK inhibitors work for about half of people with axial spondylarthritis and their best effect is after about three months or longer. There's again little difference between uh, whether a person has ankylosing spondylitis or non-radiographic axial spa. We think 40 to 50% for both of those types of axial spa. Um, what I did want to highlight is that we only have one study uh, among people who have non-radiographic axial spa. And that study is hot off the press. Um, as I was finalizing this talk last night, I was emailing Dr. Atul Deadar, who presented this in Europe in the beginning of June. Um, it has not yet been published, but that was uh, presented at a scientific conference. So thanks to him for um, sharing that information so that I could get it onto you. Um, similar to what we saw with TNF inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors, around 20 to 30% of people on placebo in these studies also get better. Um, again, just showing that the medications have quite a benefit over um, placebo effect. JAK inhibitors um, do have a different side effect profile from the biologic medications, and it is very important to consider, um, especially for people that might have risk factors for heart attacks and strokes, because there's some data in rheumatoid arthritis that risk of heart attacks and strokes is increased with use of these medications. Um, Tofus and Nibrazeljans is the only one that has been studied, but it is thought to be a class effect. There's conflicting data, as I've shown you a couple of times. There was a large observational study looking at the electronic health records of people that use tofacitinib, and this did not show an increase in uh, strokes or heart attacks or blood clots. There was also an analysis of a trial in people with psoriatic arthritis who got tofacitinib, and this did not show an increased risk. This being said, the FDA looked at this data and was concerned enough about it that they issued a black box warning for tofacitinib and other medications in the class um, around concern or caution about the use because of the risk of heart attacks and strokes. Um, I will talk uh, briefly, excuse me while I just um, address the topic. My slides are a little bit out of order. I'm sorry about that. Oh, I've hidden one. My apologies. So I did want to just also um, mention before I go into the sites of inflammation, the black box warning um, does still apply and we do still have a concern. We don't use these medications if a person either has heart disease, has had a stroke, or has risk factors um, for heart attack or stroke. Um, these medications have been used, at least tofacitinib has been used for people with rheumatoid arthritis for over a decade. So although we do want to be cautious about their use, um, the risk is likely quite small because over a decade it's been hard to even uh, estimate what the risk is. Um, but something to certainly follow and to keep in mind as you discuss these medications uh, with your healthcare provider. Okay, um, so in regards to the sites where these medications work, we've been mostly focusing on spinal inflammation, chest wall inflammation, um, as the main uh, area of, of uh, inflammation among people that have axial spondyl arthritis. There is good rationale for this. Um, the medications that I've spoken about in terms of both um, scientific studies in humans and um, in animals and other types of scientific studies about the specific cytokines or cell signals that promote inflammation in different sites. So when we look at joints outside of the spine, there are different uh, chemicals that we haven't spoken about today. And that's because in the axial skeleton or the spine, the main signals that promote inflammation are IL-17 and TNF. 
Um, and so those are the biologics we spoke about. Um, for people that have enthesitis, which is inflammation where a tendon or a muscle attaches onto bone, there are also other signals that are important in that site of inflammation. And the same is true for people who have psoriasis or skin inflammation with spondylarthritis. Um, and then finally, the gut or uh, intestines have yet a different uh, profile of chemicals that promote inflammation there. So as you and your healthcare provider kind of think about how best to select a medication for you, you'd want to take into account which parts of, of your body have the most significant inflammation or most significant um, involvement. Uh, I'm going to put two slides up here pretty quickly, and these will be included in the um, slide deck online for your reference. But when I have a person that I'm meeting with and trying to pick the best treatment, it's often helpful to try to think of whether there's one medication that would address a few different um, concerns of theirs versus a different medication for each different thing. So IBD is inflammatory bowel disease in the top of this figure. We have axial spa on the left side. We have peripheral arthritis affecting the joints of the arms and legs on the right. And it's just important to remember there are medications that work for each different combination of, um, of things. The same is true if we think about axial spa, psoriatic arthritis, usually affecting the arms and legs and skin psoriasis. There are medications that work for each thing separately. And then there are some nice combinations that work for all three things. Um, those are the medications we spoke about today. So um, I think I'm pretty short on time, but I'll briefly address uh, two concepts. One is the treat to target concept. And that's the idea that we shouldn't aim for 10% improvement or 20% improvement, but we should be trying for most people to get into disease remission so that their spondyl arthritis is not active at all. If this isn't possible, experts have said, low disease activity is also a, an acceptable target. Now this sounds like a very good idea, but there are some downsides because treat to target probably involves more frequent check-ins um, and more frequent testing to make sure medications are not causing a problem. So in trials where people have done treat to target versus regular treatment, um, the treat to target means meeting with the healthcare provider once a month. So that's quite hard if you have a job where you don't have paid sick time. Sometimes there's more frequent blood tests required. Sometimes there are more frequent side effects because we're increasing medication a little bit more quickly than we would using the standard way of um, changing medications. Another thing to think about is that the treat to target might not be targeting the things that are most important to a, an individual, to you. Um, so keeping in mind what's import, most important to you um, and making sure your healthcare provider is really what I think the best way to address treatment. The way treat to tar target has worked is by using um, a disease activity score called ASDAS. And when we look at this figure, we can see in the right part of the column are the orange and red fields. These are high disease activity, very high disease activity. Those are bad and certainly not a target of treatment. What we wanna do is move people toward the left side, which is inactive disease or remission. If that's not possible, low disease activity. And you'll see when we do this calculation, it includes a few different questions, a few dis different aspects of spondyl arthritis, the back pain, peripheral joint pain, morning stiffness, and then again, a global assessment from the person about how active their spondyl arthritis is. This measure also includes a blood test for inflammation, either the CRP or the ESR or SED rate. And so there have been a couple trials. This is not great news, but one of the trials had to stop early because they weren't able to recruit enough people. The other trial is called Tycho Spa, and this was completed. It included people with axial spa, who axial spondyl arthritis who had high activity and who could start NSAIDs. So these are people pretty early in their um, condition. In the treat target or T2T arm, they had monthly visits. Unfortunately, after a year of being on monthly visits versus standard management, there were no differences in the primary outcome. There were a bunch of other secondary outcomes that did show a difference between treat to target versus standard 
um, treatment by a healthcare provider. And so this also needs a little bit more study before we could say to everyone, yes, you should be coming in every month so we can make changes if you're not better. Okay, last but not least, we'll talk about medications for axial spondyl arthritis and COVID infections. So um, unsaid medications are not associated with risk of, TNF, of uh, COVID infection. I wanted to move on and talk about TNF inhibitors because those do increase risk of other infections. Thankfully, the data has shown that using TNF inhibitors is not associated with a risk of more severe COVID infection and people who are on TNF inhibitors may have a lower risk of being hospitalized with COVID. That's maybe because they're not using um, other medications that are risky. One example would be uh, prednisone or steroids, which does make people at risk of more severe COVID. IL-17 inhibitors really don't have enough data to say whether there's risk or not. So if there is risk, it's probably quite small because it hasn't uh, come out yet after two years. Um, JAK inhibitors also have conflicting data, and uh, among people who are taking JAK inhibitors, they were more likely to have a severe infection with, uh, with coronavirus. However, you've probably also heard about uh, trials treating people who were hospitalized with COVID infections, and that tofacitinib, one of the JAK inhibitors, made people um, more likely to survive and, and more likely to have respiratory recovery. Um, if they were treated in the hospital. So the way I interpret these the conflicting data is that people who use JAK inhibitors may actually be a little bit sicker. They may have more severe spondyl arthritis, and that may be the reason um, they're more likely uh, to get severe infection. Maybe not the medication, but this is something that certainly warrants further study, and people on JAK inhibitors do need to be quite careful. Um, so I'll summarize a few takeaway points, and then I will open things up for questions. Um, what I reviewed today were these 2019 guidelines um, recommending first-line treatment for all forms of axial spondyl arthritis with NSAIDs and physical therapy. The medication treatment that we next use if a person doesn't improve is a TNF inhibitor. And then if not better, or if side effects, they go on to an IL-17 inhibitor. And then if not improved, they would go on to a JAK inhibitor. These guidelines um, will be readdressed within the next year or two, and there may be some differences the next time uh, experts review the literature. Um, all of the medication classes uh, I reviewed today work in about half of people with spondyl arthritis. So that includes the TNF inhibitors, the IL-17 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors, um, all for people who haven't previously been on biologic meds. All of the TNF, IL-17, and JAK inhibitors increase the risk of infection somewhat. JAK inhibitors may also increase the risk of heart attacks, strokes, and possibly cancers. The treat-to-target approach has some promise, but needs some further study um, before we could say that it's appropriate for um, people in the United States. Um, and we can look forward to some upcoming guidelines uh, to incorporate the newer science on JAK inhibitors and the treat-to-target approach. And with that, I'd like to thank, so greatly thank uh, SAA for the invitation to do this talk uh, and for their support, as well as the support of uh, others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dubrow, for that really informative presentation. We're now moving into our Q&A session. Please type your questions into the Q&A module at the bottom of your screen if you haven't yet, and we'll read them out loud for Dr. Dubril to answer, getting to as many as we can. Um, just a reminder to please keep your questions general in nature, benefit of everyone in attendance. I do have a number of questions that we've come um, that have come in already, so we will try to get to um, hopefully all of them. Okay, so first question, uh, is there a good CRP level to indicate that inflammation is well controlled in people with AS? Uh, and then uh, a follow-up similar question, is ESR test a good measure of inflammation in people with AS? And what is a good level to indicate that inflammation is well controlled? Yeah, so thank you for those questions. 
um, some people have had some experience getting these tests and kind of uh, struggling to know how important they are. So one thing to remember is that the blood tests are just one way of figuring out whether a person has active spondyl arthritis or whether it's quiet. We saw in some of those outcome measures that there are a lot of questions that we weigh more heavily. So it's about an individual person's report, how they're feeling, how they're moving, how they're sleeping. And so those things tend to be more important than just the blood test. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that if the blood test is not, you know, not looking better, but you're feeling better, that's more important than the blood test. Um, so the, the good CRP level, there is um, international controversy, but the levels that have been used are level of 10, 8, or 6 in various studies. So we think a level below that is, you know, perfect. Now, I do have some patients who come in with levels up to hundreds. And so for some people, the inflammation is so high that we may never see it go down to under 10. But when we see it, a, an improvement, that's something that helps, um, you know, reinforce our plan of care. Um, for SUD rate, um, CRP tends to go up and down a little bit quicker, and so we can see that um, better, uh, more quickly in response to a change in treatment. Um, SUD rate tends to be a little bit slower, and it can reflect some other, um, other aspects of, of uh, the body. The normal of SUD rate is under 20, but this really changes uh, with age. And we think for every decade of life you get to live, you get 10 more uh, units on SUD rate to be normal. So if you're in your 30s, your sed normal SUD rate can go up to 30 as well. Thank you. Sorry, I had muted myself. Uh, thank you. That was a very, very thorough answer. Um, do you have an opinion about the relationship between gut health and NSAIDs? Some argue that NSAIDs damage lower intestines. Yes. So we know for sure NSAIDs can, uh, NSAIDs do increase the risk of heartburn symptoms, of um, ulcer disease within the stomach. And it's also likely that uh, particularly one group of NSAIDs can also contribute to inflammation and ulcers in the lower intestines as well, the colon and uh, small intestine. Um, in relation to the question about gut health, I think this is also addressing like microbiome and um, bacteria and other microorganisms in the gut. And so we know there's a very important association among people that have axial spondyl arthritis. Um, in particular, uh, who have HLA B27. So we don't know which direction things go. It may be that the gene HLA B27 allows certain bacteria to thrive, and those may allow, um, allow inflammation to happen. Um, or there may be other relationships between HLA B27 and the way bacteria um, interact with our immune cells or cross uh, their parts of bacteria cross um, the intestinal um, intestine and interact with our immune cells. So it's a very complex relationship and there have not been consistent studies that show exactly how things are related, but they almost certainly are. And perhaps in five or 10 years with better genetic studies and better technology to really understand bacteria and other microorganisms in the gut, I think we're gonna understand that relationship more in, in a short period of time. Thank you. Uh, in many other conditions, combination therapy generally works better than monotherapy, but it appears that in, in AS that is not the case. Why do you think that is, considering that many factors are involved in the inflammatory process? Yeah, we have a, a real scientific question here, so thank you for, for that. Um, what we think combination therapy um, achieves for some people is the prevention of developing antibodies against the medication. So these biologic medicines, the TNF inhibitors and the IL-17 inhibitors, among other types of injection therapies, they're huge proteins that when they get in our system, our immune cells recognize them as foreign. 
an attempt to neutralize them or block them by making antibodies that bind. Um, so we think combination therapy and other, uh, other diseases prevents the body from making antibodies against the medication. Why that doesn't seem to be much benefit in spondyl spondylarthritis is not really known, um, but it's not thought that it prevents the anti-drug antibody formation. Um, it may have something to do with the spine that other medications just don't affect spinal inflammation processes as much. Um, but to date, you know, when the guidelines were developed, there was not um, enough literature in favor of using combination therapy. And so experts thought the risk was really not worth it. Thank you, that's fascinating. Um, can you speak to the prognosis of people diagnosed late in, disease, in the disease progress, say after 20 years of inflammation? How are treatment outcomes different in these group of people than for those who are diagnosed and treated earlier in the disease process? Yeah, it's a very important question because we know most people with axial spa don't get diagnosed. You know, for women, there's uh, an average delay of eight years from the time their symptoms start to when they get diagnosed. And for men, it's maybe a little shorter, six years, but still quite a long time. Um, and for many people I've met, it is on the order of, of decades. So the prognosis is a little bit different if people have um, bone formation and particular spine bones are fused, we really have a different goal of therapy, uh, a different goal of treatment uh, versus people who are newer in the disease where we want to stop therapy and we want to stop the excess bone formation. So for people that have had longer standing disease, um, we do want to control inflammation, but we also really want to address flexibility and function. And we want to think about what activities they need to do on a daily basis to maintain their independence um, and, and to be safe in their own home or their own environment. And so, you know, one of my goals of therapy is making sure people get into work with a physical therapist. If they have other complex medical issues, there are um, physical medicine physicians who can also help guide movement and um, improve move movement. We wanna work on balance. We want to work on um, adaptations to the environment to make movement as safe as possible. Um, we want to work on movement of the thoracic spine to make sure that if a person, you know, if they've had AXPA for 20 years and they're in their 60s, 70s, 80s, um, we want to make sure their thoracic spine movement is really good in case they got a pneumonia so that hopefully we'd keep them out of the hospital, they could breathe and recover from uh, something like that well. So it does change the goal of therapy. Among people that have had disease for 20 years and have bone formation already, the bone formation will never go away, but we wanna stop more from, from forming. Thank you very much. Um, can you discuss pain and fatigue in spa? What causes these in the disease? Um, I'm on my second TNF and my pain and fatigue are not controlled. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question and for bringing up something that I think um, physicians and researchers haven't addressed well thus far, but I think is coming into light as to being a very important part of spondyl arthritis and other inflammatory diseases. So oftentimes pain and fatigue are linked for people and when we can, you know, one gets better, the other gets better as well. But for other people, they're, they're not linked. And even when pain is better, the fatigue still persists. Um, we don't know precisely, the fatigue question in particular, we don't know precisely what causes it. And it's probably a lot of things together. So one being the inflammation that takes energy, um, takes cellular energy and, and your energy away um, as part of the inflammatory process. Um, we know that when people have pain and it disrupts their sleep, that causes fatigue to be worse, of course. We also know that when people have chronic pain or chronically disrupted sleep, they're more likely to have depression and anxiety. And so that's another contributor to fatigue. Um, so those are kind of the three main contributors that I can point to directly. 
occasionally there are medications that don't agree with the person. So we would, you know, scour a medication list and just ensure that all the medications we think are doing their job. Um, and then another contributor is kind of that it's quite hard to uh, exercise for many people when they're in pain and um, kind of lack of exercise also contributes to fatigue. So that's part of the uh, foundational treatment that I spoke about. Physical therapy is not only for mobility and strength, it also improves inflammation and, and improves fatigue. It's a very complex thing to address and um, I'm sorry for what you're going through. You're, you're really not alone. And I think drug companies have recognized this importance. We're starting to see um, studies that, uh, that show the effect of a medication on fatigue specifically. And so it's another thing I'm very hopeful will be better equipped to address within a couple of years time. Thank you very much. Um, for when should I start physical therapy after being diagnosed? It's a nice follow-up to what we were just discussing. Right away. <laughs> um, as soon as your doctor can connect you with a physical therapist that has, you know, the adequate expertise to um, address spinal mobility and other common joints for spondyl arthritis, go in there right away. Um, it's not a huge time commitment, so that's often hard for people that have a job or other um, personal responsibilities, but we generally go for an hour a week for a 12-week course. That's what most insurance companies will cover within a year's time. Um, and then you could consider a refresher the following year or in five years time if you'd like. But um, no time to waste. You, you've got nothing to lose because of the benefits um, to you know, spinal pain, to movement, to strength. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I have read that mechanisms for excess, I'm sorry, just one quick second. I need to unmute myself. I've read that mechanisms for excess bone formation continue even after inflammation has been controlled. Is that your understanding as well? And is anything being studied to stop the bone changes from progressing? Yes, thank you. So we do know that bone formation can continue to happen after the inflammation process is stopped. Um, that's exactly true. So part of AXPA, uh, the reason it happens is uh, abnormal inflammation pathways, but also abnormal bone formation pathways. And they're, they're linked in complex ways. We know if we control um, inflammation, a person is less likely to have more bone, bone formation. So there's still rationale to be pretty aggressive with medications, even if a person has uh, bone formation, excess bone formation already. Um, and then the question about, is anything being studied to stop the bone changes? It is a major goal of all the medications that are in development that I know of. And there are studies specifically of medications um, around bone metabolism pathways. They are not yet even in phase two. So among the, the drug trials, either phase one, phase two, phase three, and then it can be um, you know, prescribed for people. Among the medications are very early in development and not yet even in phase two. So just being studied, and I would say that's probably a longer um, time away in the, in the five to seven year range that we'll start seeing those. Thank you. Can you comment on using antibiotics or probiotics in treating AS in people with HLA-B27? Yes. Um, so thanks for that question. Getting again at the microbiome. Um, there is a limited amount of data um, in favor of some specific antibiotic regimens um, for axial spondyl arthritis. The data is not high quality and not in large groups um, and not consistent across different antibiotic regimens. So the data is overall um, doesn't support antibiotic treatment on a large scale. Um, in terms of uh, uh, antibiotics to kind of treat an infection, we know there are important infection triggers for some people. Um, in particular, people who have certain um, diarrheal infections or infections of their, their bladder and genitourinary tract, um, those can often 
precede or start the development of axial spinal arthritis. And so, you know, we do have people complete treatment for those type of infections. Um, it's, it's early literature and I, my guess, my guess is that um, the treatment will not necessarily be antibiotics because those tend to have pretty broad effects and in, including some, taking out some bacteria that have benefits to us. Um, but I think we may see uh, microbiome transplants um, or ways of getting beneficial bacteria um, into people in the, in the future. Thank you. Um, is the excess bone growth in AS more likely to advance osteoporosis? Yes. Um, so they are not directly linked, but for people that have inflammation in their vertebral bones, their spine bones, um, they are more likely to develop osteoporosis. So this can happen even in people that are fairly young um, or who haven't had spinal arthritis for very long. Um, I don't test everyone for, for bone density for osteoporosis, but for people that have, young people that have um, pretty severe disease, I do send them, even if they're in their 20s or 30s, um, because there are medications that can um, stabilize or, or um, help build bone back up in a beneficial way to prevent spinal fractures. Um, this is a particularly tricky area for women. Um, for men who are not carrying children, um, we can use the medications for osteoporosis. For women who may become pregnant, the osteoporosis medications are not safe. Um, and so we have an unmet need to kind of address the spinal inflammation. We want to we get it under control with medications for axial spot, but then secondarily, we also want to address osteoporosis. Thank you very much. And there was a question on what is the uh, what are the appropriate biologic medications for women considering pregnancy? Yeah, great question. Um, so TNF inhibitors are very safe, and the um, science behind that comes not only from axial spinal arthritis, but more so from rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis inflammatory uh, bowel disease, arthritis um, people. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been able to contribute um, data on the safety of TNF inhibitors. Um, the safest of all the TNF inhibitors is Simzia, sertilizumab. And that's just because of the, the hugeness of the protein molecule. And so it doesn't even cross the placenta. Um, for the others, they're also very safe. We make them even safer by um, stopping them in the third trimester for women who are, um, whose spinal arthritis is in remission or pretty quiet. We stop them in the third trimester so that by the time the baby is born, there's no TNF inhibitor in the body anymore. Um, and then the woman can resume it um, after the baby is born um, because it then doesn't, uh, doesn't get into the baby. It's um, if a woman is even breastfeeding, the, bi the biologic medication can get into the breast milk, but it's a protein and the baby's stomach digests it like all other proteins. So after pregnancy, it's particularly easy to get back on TNF inhibitors. Um, data for other biologics is not as, um, not as clear. And so for IL-17 inhibitors, we generally try to stop them uh, in pregnancy so far. Um, and the JAK inhibitors are, are not appropriate for pregnancy, not safe. Thank you very much. Um, I've read that women often present with different symptoms and different pain locations than men. Any thoughts on why this may be the case? Yeah, very cool question. Um, we see differences between men and women. We also see differences um, depending on whether a person has psoriatic arthritis or not, and um, involvement of different levels of the spine. So by definition, axial spinal arthritis occurs in the pelvis joints, the sacroiliac joints. Um, for women in particular, and those with psoriatic arthritis, it may occur in other areas and not the sacroiliac joints. So that's one 
um, interesting and perplexing difference under scientific study, but I couldn't give a precise answer as to why different sites. Thank you very much. Um, if I heard correctly, researchers are investigating personalizing NSAIDs to our genetic makeup. Is this being done for TNF, IL-17, and JAX? And if so, how many years until we can see this in clinical decision making? Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, the the um, kind of broad use of genetics metabolism data um, isn't quite ready for TNF inhibitors or IL-17 inhibitors. Um, there are smaller scale studies with dozens or um, hundreds of patients um, using genetics data or other proteomics, so protein signatures or other metabolism signatures to predict whether a person would do well with a TNF inhibitor or not. Um, I don't know exactly for IL-17 inhibitors, but my guess is those are also underway. Um, the reason why it's been a little bit easier for NSAIDs is that the metabolism is a little bit simpler. Um, and so the, the meta metabolism pathways for the NSAIDs are similar to other pill forms of medications. And so it's been possible to kind of push out on a big scale, but I'm hopeful. Fantastic, thank you. Um, are spa diseases considered chronic progressive? Meaning if left untreated, will they progressively worsen over time or can these conditions go into long-term remission when it might be okay to stop um, treating with medication? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are uh, you know, a big proportion of people who either need to take only NSAIDs and, and exercise um, or who take therapy for some period of time. And after a couple of years of being in remission, you know, talking with their healthcare provider, they decide to come off therapy. Um, we do know predictors of people who are more likely to have severe disease, or, or more active disease. So it tends to be men, tends to be people with HLA B27, tends to be people that have high CRPs or inflammation on MRI. Um, and it tends to be people that have excess bone formation when they first get diagnosed. So, uh, and smokers. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I work with a, an individual patient based on what their wishes are for treatment. There are some people that just don't ever want to try coming off of treatment because they're so fearful about having those symptoms that, you know, once we're really interfering with their life. There are other people that want to get off, want to try getting off treatment as soon as possible. So after a year and a half or after two years of being, um, being quiet with their spondyl arthritis, we'll try to space out medications or try to stop it if that's what they really want. Um, so, you know, I, I told you the things that predict more severe disease, the opposite of those predict milder disease, but there's no real guarantee that if a person comes off medication, their symptoms and inflammation won't come back. So there's always a risk uh, in coming off medication. With these biologic medications, there's a risk with coming off that your body might make antibodies that bind to the medication and make it not work a second time. So that this is a complex decision that each individual person has to work with their own healthcare provider you know, at every visit or every year or two to really think through. Thank you. Uh, two questions I'm going to combine together. Um, is there any data on opioids on cannabis and spa? And then what is the role of acute or chronic use of opioids in pain management of AS, considering potential risk reward? And do your views differ from those by ACR on this? Um, ACR did not specifically address uh, opioids to my knowledge. Um, and there have not been studies, to my knowledge, about the effects of opioids on inflammation. What is available is the effect of opioids on chronic pain. And unfortunately, the data suggests that opioids do not have a good benefit on chronic pain and may even worsen chronic pain, in particular back pain. Um, 
So these are medications we use very cautiously and only for short periods, as short as needed, if at all. Um, they are not generally prescribed for chronic pain. Um, the, the information about CBD is maybe a little more promising. There is some literature about certain cannabinoid receptors um, having an effect on inflammation. And so we need more data. This needs to be studied scientifically um, and not just you know, by symptoms. We probably need scientific studies about inflammation markers and MRIs um, and long-term effects because CBD, when it's taken systemically, does have some potential negative side effects. So is there a way of um, purifying the cannabinoid molecule that has the anti-inflammatory effect or otherwise minimizing side effects, just like we do for other medications It needs to be rigorously tested? Thank you. Um, do, do inflammation and pain always correlate? Uh, meaning, you know, if one has a uh, if one has chronic pain that is really acting up, does it necessarily mean that um, it's the inflammation that's driving it? Yeah, so you're right on target that inflammation and pain don't always precisely correlate. We think they correlate better in the beginning of the inflammation. So the, the pain signal in the beginning is intended to um, tell our brains to, to stop doing that, to protect the body part that's inflamed um, and allow it to heal. With chronic pain, the, um, the pathways are kind of solidified. The pathways are made always active or uh, overactive, even after the inflammation has resolved. This is an area of active study as well around the neuroplasticity. So the, the way the nerve signalings, uh, nerve signaling um, takes place or becomes overactive or chronically active, it's an area of, of study. Um, so we don't, we have therapies for uh, chronic pain syndromes when inflammation is not present. And so that's something I really work with uh, you know, people in my office to try to figure out, is the inflammation still something we need to address or is it this chronic pain pathway that's overactive, which is addressed in a different way? So it's addressed through making sure sleep is not disrupted. It's addressed through treating anxiety and um, depression and it's addressed through these chronic pain pathways through different medications. Thank you very much. Are the early symptoms of AS in juveniles different from adults? Aside from getting started with physical therapy, ASAP, is there um, any difference in treatment approaches between young children and adults? Um, so yes, um, one of the main differences is um, we, we don't truly know how commonly back pain um, is happening in children. Children are oftentimes not great about recognizing there is a problem or reporting that it, there is a problem um, because if you grow up with, with back pain or with joint pain, you never realize that that's not normal. Um, and kids are just so resilient, resilient and adaptive. Um, sometimes for juvenile, um, arthritis, they're, they're limping and they can't walk before it's even recognized that they, they have arthritis. So um, there are studies underway. Pam Weiss is really a leader. Dr. Pam Weiss from um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is a leader in this field. And um, through her work and the work of the CARA registry, they're studying uh, how commonly back pain, how common back pain is in children. We know in children there's a con um, condition related to spondyloarthritis called enthesitis associated arthritis. And that's again where the tendons attach onto bone. So we think those are really a key part of this arthritis, this condition in kids. Um, I've forgotten the second part of the oh, treatments for kids. Um, they're, they're quite similar. There are some medications that we don't really know about safety in children. We don't have as much literature about safety in children, but NSAIDs have been well studied. Um, TNF inhibitors have been really well studied. And so those two most common therapies are, are used very commonly. Thank you very much. 
how do you treat costochondritis? Uh, with, with great difficulty. Um, so costochondritis is a condition of inflammation or pain in the front of the chest where the ribs attach to the breastbone. Um, it can be due to the joint involvement. It can be due to ligament um, disruption or inflammation around the ligament. It could be due to muscle. It could be due to inflammation of the lining of the lung. Um, and it can be due to a pinched nerve in the back or irritation of a nerve that comes around from the thoracic spine. Lots of different causes. Um, for people with axial spondylarthritis, generally it is the joint or the ligament emphasis of that site. And so we treat it like an arthritis of any other joint in the body um, with NSAIDs, if NSAIDs don't help, TNF inhibitors, escalating the biologic therapy in that way. If there's a single site that is inflamed, and that's the case for a couple of people that I can think of, um, we can do glucocorticoid or cortisone injections of that site. And then it's also possible to try some topical, some skin cream or other therapies um, for that site because it's just so close to, to under the skin. Thank you very much. Um, could you address the use of IL-6 inhibitors in peripheral spondyloarthritis? Okay, so peripheral spondyloarthritis and IL-6 inhibitors. Um, so IL-6 inhibitors are most commonly used for other things like rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory conditions. Um, they have been studied in spondyloarthritis um, in the spine and not thought to be effective. I'm sure there is a limited data or some trials that show an effect in peripheral joints, um, but for most of what we understand about why spondylarthritis develops, IL-6, that inflammatory signal, um, isn't thought to be a key part of the, the pathways. That's not a very satisfying answer. Sorry about that. No, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, does juvenile onset AS give any predictor of progression of the disease as an adult? Um, so I will have to say I can't answer that question with much authority because I am an adult rheumatologist. Um, I don't know that literature in great detail. Um, my guess is HLA-B27 is probably related and probably the overall amount of inflammation, kind of overall spinal inflammation or peripheral joint inflammation is likely to, to predict how severe things get. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Um, there are inflammatory aspects of IBS. How common is the association of patients who have AXPA and IBS? Yeah, so IBS being irritable bowel syndrome, um, and that's different than inflammatory bowel syndrome. Um, the symptoms are equally distressing, but due to different underlying causes. So we know there is an association of axial spa with irritable bowel uh, syndrome. And um, we don't necessarily know how to address the overlap between those two. Um, the best you know, suggestion I could give would be working pretty closely with a gastroenterologist and typically a nutritionist that the gastroenterologist recommends um, to really recognize that the individual person, your individual um, food triggers or situational triggers um, and how to get things kind of minimized in terms of the irritable bowel symptoms. Thank you very much. Um, a few more really interesting questions I'm hoping to try and get to really quickly. Um, should, which part of the country, or, or do you, is there any um, research on this, um, have more risk for fungal infections? I think this relates to the, the risk of fungal infection in um, some of the biologics. Yes. Um, so you will, you will know if you <laughs> live in one of these regions. Um, it tends to be the southwest where air is quite dry and fungal spores get blown around. So coccidiomycosis and um, histo are two of those fungal infections. Um, you, you can ask your uh, healthcare provider if it's any concern. Um, they, will, they will know. They will recommend testing if you're in one of those areas. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, there's a really nice comment. Thank you for specializing in rheumatology, which I wholeheartedly second. 
Thank you. <laughs> um, should, should people with AS over 70, in, in your opinion, continue to use NSAIDs? How, um, you know, the risk and benefit ratio? Yeah, so oftentimes what pe when people get into their 70s, they've got a little bit of high blood pressure, they've got a little bit of high cholesterol. Um, so we, your primary care doctor would also want to be involved in this decision. Um, if blood pressure is out of control and not getting better with blood pressure medications, um, if you have a, a moderate risk of having a heart attack or stroke, probably NSAIDs are not a good option. If you have kidney function that's not pretty good, that's not perfect or pretty good, then NSAIDs are also not a good option. Um, the third thing is, or the fourth or third thing that is not necessarily related to age, but is liver function. Um, so sometimes with age, we gain a little bit of weight, we get a little bit more fat in our liver and the liver also metabolizes NSAIDs. So occasionally we'll need to stop it because of um, liver dysfunction, but that's not always related to age. But it's worth revisiting at a, you know, an annual visit with your healthcare provider and just checking that it's not contributing to a, a risk. Thank you. And I'll make this my final question. Um, can a COVID vaccine trigger AXPA or um, aggravate symptoms? Probably, yes. Um, so COVID vaccines, um, there have been reports of uh, they're triggering many different inflammatory conditions. Um, for most people, those symptoms have been transient and gone away without any specific treatment, but there are a handful of case reports of inflammatory, chronic inflammatory conditions coming on shortly after COVID vaccine. Um, this was almost anticipated based on previous science, um, yet in the face of a global pandemic, it was probably still the best thing for our you know, global society to try to prevent COVID infections, which can also uh, trigger autoimmune diseases. Um, hey, that was my follow-up. Can, yeah. can actually having COVID also trigger yes. some of these conditions? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. The inflammatory conditions that the infection triggers most commonly are those around um, blood clotting events, which are, which are probably driven by an immune condition. Um, and I'm sorry, was the second question about safety as uh, related to the vaccine? Um, no, it was actually about if, uh, if vaccine or, you know, also uh, inf COVID infection can uh, trigger a flare, worsen symptoms. Yes. Um, so yes, it can. Um, you know, among people without an uh, inflammatory condition, many people still got um, achy muscles and sore joints after getting a vaccine. So the same is true for people with AXPA that you know, they, people can develop those same symptoms and it may be worse for people who have axial spondyloarthritis. Um, the main way I counsel people before asking them to go get their COVID shot uh, is to, to get the shot on a day when you're able to, to rest the following two days. So for a lot of people, that's a Friday if you have a weekend off from work. Um, to not plan big events after getting the COVID shot and kind of plan to, to lay low and just do stretching and gentle range of motion exercises on those days um, and to um, use NSAIDs if needed afterwards. Um, there's some controversy as to whether using NSAIDs might prevent, uh, you know, the reaction to the appropriate response to a COVID vaccine or other vaccines, but there are two very different branches of the immune system, one about uh, inflammation and one about kind of developing antibodies and cells against the bacteria. So there's not good rationale to not take NSAIDs, um, particularly among people who have AXPA and who may be feeling much worse symptoms if they stay off their NSAID a couple days. So be gentle with yourself, show yourself the grace of a couple days to uh, recover. And then if it's something longer than that, a person really would want to get in touch with their rheumatologist or their healthcare provider to get a plan to kind of recover things. Thank you very much. And the final kind of follow-up to that was, um, do you see in patients, and does research show that uh, 
contracting COVID, does that in some cases also worsen spa symptoms? Um, that's a, a really great, great question. Um, I know SAA has done some research about this uh, in terms of sending out a questionnaire to SAA members. Um, I, I think it is likely that infection does worsen symptoms, but I don't think we have data to really show that. It's just hard to capture um, in terms of getting information about disease activity when a person has just had an infection. So we don't have a good system for collecting those data. I don't think the study has been done, but thank you. Gotcha. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dubril. Um, this was just a fantastic presentation.